me get my book light situated. Chapter 14, What Torin Did. Oh, Casper is, um, sorry, Casper is Torin's older brother, right? All day after Casper and Maddie left, Mrs. Murdo wondered where Lena was. Had the doctor sent her on an errand? She asked, but the answer was no. Did Torin know where she was? He said he didn't know and he didn't care. Thinking maybe Lena had gone to the Pioneer Hotel to see Dune, Mrs. Murdo walked down there, but no one had seen her. By evening, when Lena was still missing, Mrs. Murdo was very worried. She found the note in her book that night. She frowned as she read it. This didn't seem like a good idea to her. It was one of Lena's rash, impulsive acts, and probably it was dangerous. Mrs. Murdo went downstairs, knocked on the doctor's door, and showed her the note. Can we send someone after them, she said, to bring her back? But the doctor shook her head. They're a whole day ahead, she said. No one could catch up, even if you could find someone willing to go. So Mrs. Murdo went back to bed and tried to sleep. She told herself that Lena had survived many dangers before, but still she lay awake worrying most of the night. In the morning, at breakfast, Torrin asked where Lena was and Mrs. Murdo told him. He jumped up from his chair. He threw down his piece of bread, which bounced on the table. She went with them, he cried. She went with Casper? Calm down, said Dr. Hester. No, yelled Torin. I won't calm down. I hate her. I hate all you cave people. Why did you have to come here and ruin everything? With a furious swipe of his hand, he knocked over Mrs. Murdo's cup of tea. He kicked backward at his chair, which fell over, and he ran out of the room. Through the window, Mrs. Murdo saw him racing across the courtyard and out the gate. Jealous, said the doctor. He wants Casper all to himself. Heaven knows why. That boy craves attention, said Mrs. Murdo. I doubt that he cares who it comes from. I suppose you're right, said the doctor, looking at Mrs. Murdo with faint surprise. Torrin sped down the river road, full of boiling rage. He was the one who should be sitting beside Casper, not that fat Maddie and not that stupid cave girl. He should be there, riding on the truck, going away to be a roamer but she had snuck off and done it instead, and he hated her for it. <clears throat> it was the worst thing that had happened to him in his whole life. He ran a long way, his feet pounding the dusty road, his fists pumping back and forth, furious tears streaming down his face. When he stopped, panting, he was way out in the tomato field, not far from the wind tower where he had been the day the cave people came over the hill. He remembered how they had looked, like a swarm of horrible insects coming down toward the village. Now the cave people had settled in as if they were going to stay forever. They were eating food that should belong to the Sparks people. They were wearing clothes that Sparks people had given them. They walked around in the streets of Sparks as if they belonged here. Torrin wanted them gone. He stomped among the tomato plants, throwing punches at the air. Get out of here, get out, he cried, as if Lena and all the Emberites was there to hear him. <clears throat> his thoughts were like flames inside his head. He kept seeing Casper on the seat of his truck with Maddie on one side of him and Lena on the other. The feeling that went with this picture was like a sharp stick in his stomach. If only he had one of those giant bombs that they had in the old days. He imagined that they were about the size of watermelons. He would shoot one at Lena. Pow! It would sail halfway to the city and drop right on Casper's truck and blow them all up. Then he would shoot another one at the Pioneer Hotel. Blam! It would flatten the building and blow up every one of the cave people. He longed to throw that big bomb. He could almost feel it in his hands. He'd come out at the end of the row of plants now, where a small whitewashed storage shed stood at the edge of the field. Crates of tomatoes were stacked nearby, ready to be distributed. Without thinking, Torin grabbed a tomato from the nearest crate and hurled it against the wall of the shed. It splattered. Red water dripped down the white wall. It felt so good to do this that he did it again. In a fury, he snatched up one tomato after another. Wham! 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 He flung them with all his might, until the window of the shed splintered, the wall was a bleeding mess, 
and a long mound of broken red flesh lay on the ground. He stopped and took a breath. What would the farmers think when they saw this? Two whole crates of tomatoes, smashed. They'd be angry. But they wouldn't know he had done it, would they? No one had seen him. And that was when an idea floated into Torin's mind. A really excellent idea. He smiled, thinking about it. He threw one last tomato, aiming for the dark, glass-toothed hole of the broken window. There was a satisfying crash as the tomato knocked something over inside. Torin turned and ran, but he didn't go all the way home. When Dune came through town that morning on the way to work, he found Mrs. Murdo waiting for him by the side of the road. She signaled to him with one finger, and he left the stream of workers and came over to her. Lena has gone off, she said. I thought you should know. Gone off? Gone off where? Mrs. Murdo produced a scrap of paper from the pocket of her skirt. Read this, she said. Dune read. He scrunched up his nose in puzzlement. He remembered Lena telling him something the other day about these people, Casper and Maddie. What had she said? She tried to recall. He looked again at the note. Something important, she says. What would that be? Mrs. Murdo shrugged her thin shoulders. She gets ideas in her head, she said. Dune could see that she was worried, though she didn't say so. Well, she says she'll be back in two or three days, said Dune. That's not so long. The odd thing is, Mrs. Murdo, said Mrs. Murdo, that Casper, when he left, said he wouldn't be back for several months. Dune frowned. What was Lena up to? He didn't understand it, but he didn't want to make Mrs. Murdo more worried than she was. She must have some plan for getting back, he said, handing back the note. Of course, said Mrs. Murdo briskly. She folded the note and replaced it in her pocket. There's no need to worry. I'll have her come and find you as soon as she returns. He headed back toward the doctor's house, and Dune went toward the fields. He walked slowly to give himself time to think. He was upset about Lena. How could she be so foolish as to launch herself out into the unknown world with two unknown people? But in a way, he wasn't surprised. Lena was always eager to investigate new places. Look how she had gone up to the roof of the gathering hall on the first day she became a messenger in Ember. Look how eager she'd been to go down into the pipeworks. She probably just wanted to see what was outside of Sparks. As soon as she said, as soon as she'd satisfied her curiosity, she'd be back. But Dune was upset about Lena for another reason, too, and it didn't have to do with her safety. He was upset that she had gone exploring without him. All through the last days of Ember, they'd been partners. Now she had gone off on her own, leaving him here. He was annoyed, and he was hurt. He had to admit to himself that he hadn't been a very good friend to Lena lately. Maybe he'd hurt her feelings by paying so much attention to Tick. But still, it was Lena who was his partner in important things. If she had an urgent reason for hitching a ride with Casper... Why hadn't she told him? Why hadn't she asked him to come along? He trudged toward the tomato field, head down, scuffing his shoes irritably in the dust, and so he didn't notice until he was right up to it that a commotion was going on by the storage shed. Everyone was crowded around it, and Chugger, the team leader, was yelling. Dune hurried forward to see what was going on. Wasted! Wasted! Chugger was shouting. Two whole crates smashed! Who's done this? And the shed plastered with muck and the window broken. He glared at the crowd of workers. Any of you know about this? He demanded. Anyone know what mad person did this? No one said a word. Dune stared with horror at the mess on the wall. It looked gory, as if it were smashed animals instead of just tomatoes. He could feel the rage of the person who had done it. I don't like this, Chugger said darkly. Nothing like this ever happened before you people arrived. I want it cleaned up right away. Walls washed, window fixed, mess cleared away. Get on it. Listen, said someone. Dune turned to see. It was Tick speaking. We didn't do this. Don't get all tough with us. Chugger whipped around. Who else would do it? Who else but one of you, always griping and grumbling? But we only just got here now. How could we have done it? someone called out. Besides, we wouldn't, cried someone else. We would never waste food. More and more voices rose in protest. 
Dune added his, too, saying, It wasn't us. It couldn't have been. But Chugger just stood and scowled at them. Finally, he yelled, Quiet. Get to work. Just after that, Dune heard running footsteps behind him and turned to see Torin racing across the field. He was shouting in his shrill, high voice as he came. I saw, he cried, waving his arms, last night. I was out here and I saw. He ran into the midst of the workers and stood panting, his little eyes wild. I heard a thump, thump, thump. So I snuck up to see and I did see. Well then, said Chugger, what did you see? I saw who threw the tomatoes. I saw who made that big mess and broke the window. He stood with his neck poked forward and his skinny arms held tight to his sides. His whole body was trembling with excitement. His eyes scanned the group of workers. It was him, he shrieked, pointing straight at Dune. It was him that did it. I saw him. Dune was so shocked he couldn't make a sound. He stood with his mouth open, staring at Torin. Around him, a few people spoke up. He did not, said someone. He couldn't have. Anyway, he wouldn't. No, someone else said. He would never do that. But Chugger seized his arm and pulled it roughly aside. What do you have to say for yourself? Is this your doing? Dune shook his head. No, he said. No, that boy is lying. And why would he do that? Why would he take the trouble to come out here first thing in the morning to point to you and lie? I don't know, said Dune. Chugger released his arm with a push. I'll be keeping a special eye on you from now on, he said. But why, said Dune? I didn't do this. How do I know that, said Chugger? It's your word against his, and he's one of us. End of chapter 14. Matthew, hello. Welcome in. Happy Thursday. How are you doing? This book is getting crazy. It's getting good, though. I don't remember what happens. So I'm excited to find out. Hydration break. We're already almost 200 pages into the book, too, which is, like, nuts. They go so fast. Because they're so good. Okay. Chapter 15. A long, hot ride. Lena lay very still, or as still as she could, with the jolting of the truck over the rutted road. Her eyes were at the level of the space between the two lowest slats of the crate, so she could see out just enough to guess where they were, along the road by the river first, and then turning to go around the outskirts of the village. Occasionally, she heard someone call a greeting to Casper, and she heard Casper's voice returning it. Maddie never said anything that Lena could hear. After a while, there were no more voices. The sun beat down on Lena's back, and she began to get tr terribly hot and uncomfortable. She thought it might be safe to sit up now. The sound of the wheels would muffle any sounds she made, and she was far enough toward the back of the truck so that Casper and Maddie wouldn't see her moving. So she unfolded herself. She peered out and saw emptiness. Vast stretches of dry, brown, gold grass. No people, no houses. It was an enormous space. She did not realize any place could be so big. Sometime in the afternoon, because of the heat and the rocking motion of the truck, and because there was nothing else to do, Lena went to sleep. When she awoke, she could tell right away that it was nearly evening. The air was cooler, and the sun was so low in the sky that she could no longer see it overhead. Its slanting rays came between the slats of her crate. A cramp gripped her stomach. It was partly hunger. She hadn't thought to bring any food with her. But it was mostly fear. There must be, they must be close to the city, and when they arrived, what would she do? And what would Casper do when he found her? The truck slowed and came to a stop. Lena felt Casper and Maddie jump down. This looks like a good enough place, said Casper's voice, near the water anyhow. Looks all right to me, that was Maddie's voice. I'll take the animals down to the stream, said Casper. Lena heard clanking and slapping sounds as he unbuckled the harness and then the slow thud of the hooves as the oxen were led away. What was Maddie doing? Lena heard a few footsteps, some rustling among the grasses. Then there was silence. She had to move. 
Her legs were cramped, and she had a pain in her back. Cautiously, she stood up. She stepped onto the first slat of the crate, and then the second, and when she got high enough to look over the top edge, the first thing she saw was Maddie, sitting on the ground a few feet from the end of the truck, leaning against a tree and staring right at her. Well, well, said Maddie. Look who's here. Lena just stared. She couldn't move. Maddie heaved herself up from the ground and came over to the truck. She regarded Lena with a look that was half puzzled and half amused. What in the world are you doing here? I want to see the city, said Lena. Don't you know it's a five-day journey? How did you expect to ride in a crate all that time and not be discovered? Five days? I thought it was one day. Maddie just shook her head. What are we supposed to do with you? I don't know, said Lena. She felt a trembling start up in her stomach. She should never have come. There was a long pause before Maddie spoke again. Then she said, Listen, it would suit me fine if you came along to the city, if you're sure you want to. I do want to, Lena said, though she wasn't really sure. Good, said Maddie, because it looks like you have no choice. She smiled. It wasn't an unfriendly smile, but there was a quirk in it that seemed to say, What a situation. Stay here, then, she said. I'll be back. She stamped away. Lena watched Maddie heading toward a strip of green grasses and low trees that must border the stream. At the edge of the strip, she could see Casper and the oxen. In all directions, the landscape was the same she'd seen that morning, gently rolling, empty of buildings, covered with brown-gold grass. Here and there stood low, dark green mushroom-shaped trees. Three of them stood near the truck, their leaves dusty, their trunks thick and gnarled. The sun had gone down behind the hills in the west, and the sky there was scarlet. Though the air was still warm, Lena was shivered. She sat back down in the crate, pulling her knees up to her chest, and wrapped her arms around them. Somewhere, a bird sang its going-to-be-bed song. Then suddenly, there were loud footsteps and Casper's voice coming toward her, and in a moment, Casper's fist thudding against the crate. Come out, he said. Lena climbed out and stood on the truck, looking down at him. Jump down, he said. She jumped down. Casper glared at her. So, he said, a stowaway. What were you trying to do? Cause trouble? That's your idea of fun? No, Lena said. I want to see the city. What for? A look of suspicion passed over Casper's face. What do you know about the city? Nothing, said Lena. She wasn't going to tell Casper about her vision of the city, or what the city might be for the people of Ember. I just want to see it. Well, too bad, said Casper. Why should I take you there? Why would I want an extra person to feed, a kid to look after? Your ride stops right here. You can go back where you came from. One second, said Maddie. Listen to me before you decide. She could be useful to us. Don't be ridiculous. Casper whacked his two big hands together as if to dismiss the subject. Yes, she could, said Maddie. When you're looking for something in a ruined place, you know how it is. Small spaces sometimes. Tippy rubble where you need to step carefully. A small light person could go where we couldn't. Casper took a step back and studied Lena, still glowering. Lena tried to look as small and light as she could. As for food, said Maddie, she can share mine. Ridiculous, said Casper again, but he kept his eyes on Lena. She could see he was thinking. Come on, Casper, Maddie said. Let's take her. We don't have much choice, after all. The only other thing we can do is leave her out here by herself. She turned to Lena. If we let you come, she said, you'll have to work for us. You'll have to do what we say. All right, Lena said, though she wasn't sure it was all right at all. Maybe it would be better to give up seeing the city and try to get back to Sparks from here. But how would she do that? She'd never be able to find her way, and the empty lands frightened her. She didn't want to be alone in such a vast, wild place. But how will I get back again? Will you take me? You should have thought of that when you climbed onto the truck, said Casper. That's your problem, not ours. He turned to Maddie. Right, partner? Certainly, Maddie said. Now let's get settled for the night. The first thing we need is some kindling. Lena and I will go and gather it. 
Lena followed her out toward the trees. Once they were in among them, Maddie bent down and spoke to her in a low voice. Don't worry. You were foolish to do this, but I won't let harm come to you. And I'll see you get home again, somehow. She straightened up again. Now, she said, gather up some dry twigs and sticks and a few tufts of dry grass. They carried the sticks and grass back to where the truck was parked. There, Maddie scraped out a shallow hole in the ground with the heel of her shoe. In the hole, she set the smallest splinters of wood, arranging them in a sort of square. Over these, she placed some sticks, and on top of those, she added larger branches. She tucked in some handfuls of dry grass at the bottom of the stick building. Until this point, Lena did not understand what she was doing, but when she pulled from her pocket a little cloth-wrapped package, unwrapped it, and took out a short blue-tipped stick, she knew. She took in a quick breath and stepped backward. Maddie held up one of the matches and said, Have you ever seen one of these before? Yes, said Lena. You're lucky then, they're rare, said Maddie. She struck the match across a rock, and the blue tip burst into flame. She held it to the grass, and the grass sizzled and flared up. Come and stand close, she said to Lena. We need to shield this from the breeze until it gets going. But Lena stayed where she was, staring. The little flame at the heart of the stack of sticks flickered. It reached for the splintered end of a stick, caught it, set it aflame. The sizzling grew to a hissing, and then to a crackling. Flames jumped and jumped higher, and there again was the orange hand stretching upward with its pointed fingers waving, leaning toward her. Lena stumbled backward. She didn't want to be afraid. Casper and Maddie weren't. Casper had come back now and was crouching right beside the fire, feeding it with sticks and grass. But for Lena, it was as if the flames were shrieking a message at her. Run, run, run. She stood 20 feet away, staring at the fire with a pounding heart. The wind blew a ribbon of smoke at her, and when she breathed it, it stung the back of her throat. Maddie noticed after a while that she was out there. Come closer, Lena, she called. It won't hurt you. But Lena could not get her feet to walk toward that hissing, snapping blaze. It might not hurt Maddie and Casper, but if she were to stand near it, she was sure it would reach for her with that orange hand, flick its fingers against the ends of her hair or the hem of her shirt, and she too would flare up. I'm all right here, she said. I don't want to be near it. Casper laughed. Maddie lumbered to her feet and came beside Lena. She put an arm around her. You're shaking, she said. Well, never mind. You don't have to be by the fire if you don't want to. From a box on the truck, she took what they called traveler's cakes. Lumps a little smaller than a fist, made of Lena knew not what. And she and Casper stuck them on the end of long sticks and roasted them over the flames. You have to get fond of these if you're a roamer, Casper said. They keep well. That's their best quality. You need them for those long stretches where there's no other food to be found. They were dry and tasteless, but Lena was hungry, so she didn't mind. She ate her standing up, and she licked her fingers when she was through. She wondered where they were going to sleep. There was no room on the truck, so she supposed they'd have to lie on the ground. It was quite dark now. A breeze had come up. From somewhere far away, she heard an animal noise. Yip, yip, yip. Then a long wail. Then an eerie chorus of wails. What's that? she asked Maddie. Wolves, Maddie said, out hunting. They're not very close, don't worry. Lena shivered. The darkness here was so enormous, and so full of terrible things. In Ember, except when there was a blackout, People were almost always safe in their beds when darkness came. Lena wasn't used to being outside at night. She thought about Mrs. Murdo, who would be getting into bed in the doctor's attic room right now. Mrs. Murdo would be worried about her. Poppy would be saying, Where's Weena? No one would imagine that she was out in this great emptiness, with nothing between her and the sky. Maddie took some rolled-up blankets from the truck and spread them on the ground. She put two of them close to the fire, the third she offered to Lena. Put this wherever you want to sleep, she said. Lena walked over to take the blanket, and as she did, Casper tossed a big branch onto the fire. Sparks sprayed up. Some flew sideways, caught by the wind. 
Lena jumped away, but a few sparks landed on her sock. She stamped her foot frantically, but this only made the sparks burn brighter. The threads of her sock glowed. On her ankle, she felt a pain like a fierce bite. No, she cried, get it off me. She shook her leg and clawed at her sock with her hand. Panic rose up in her, and she would have taken off running if Maddie had not blocked her path and grabbed her in strong arms. Once she'd stopped her, she bent down and put a hand over the burning place in Lena's sock, and when she took her hand away, the glow was out. But the pain was still there. Maddie took off Lena's shoe and sock and poured cold water on the burn, but it didn't help much. All night, Lena huddled on the ground under the thin blanket, gritting her teeth against the pain on her leg and wishing she had never come on this awful journey. End of chapter 15. Ray Bushido, welcome in. Happy Thursday. How are you doing? How is how are you liking the story time? I love it. I love just cozying up and reading a, a nice story. It's so relaxing. And I'd probably be doing this anyway, even if I wasn't streaming. So it's very, very cozy, very, very like perfect for the day. You're a nice story. Neff, how are you doing? Happy Thursday. How's it going? Good morning. If it's morning where you are, happy time zone. I'm getting a little stretch in. <laughs> I'm in your state. Like, literally, physically, <laughs> or just like you're you have the same vibes going. <laughs> oh, okay, <laughs> that's awesome. We love to see it. South coast. Ooh, I'm not very close to the coast, unfortunately. Unfortunately. I wish I was, though. It's my favorite, like, place, is the coast. Love it. Love it. All right. Are we ready for the next chapter? I still have my, um... My pile of fall <laughs> next to me. If call me Ishmael means anything to you, then you know. Call, oh, call me Ishmael? Um, I mean, other than the, the book, right? I'm not sure. <laughs> Maybe I don't know. <laughs> Maybe I don't know. Maybe I don't. Nailed it. Nailed it. Heck yes. Like, I know the story, like the, I don't think I've ever actually technically read the story, but I know of it. Ishmael. Isn't that Moby Dick? Is that Moby Dick? I've never read Moby Dick. Or is that something else? Am I thinking, am I, yeah, okay. I've never read Moby Dick. Maybe I should. It's a classic. I don't like the classics, though, as we have discovered from playing Pros and Codes. <laughs> um, because I think we had a Moby Dick quote on one of them. And I was like, yep, don't know this. <laughs> but I knew most of the children's ones, of course, because I'm a child. So it makes sense. It checks out. It checks out. He's in a whaling town at the start of the book, um, is what I'm getting at. Okay. <laughs> well, I have been on a, um, what's it called? A whale watch um, on the coast of Massachusetts. It was very fun. We saw lots of whales. I even had one of my pictures um, blown up on a, a canvas of a, a whale tail. It's very cool. It's very cool. Um, that's all I'll say about without doxing myself. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> well, I might know where you are then. <laughs> I 
I might know where you are if you're in the same town that I went whale watching. Um, it's a very nice town, if it's the one I'm thinking of. <laughs> but I don't know if it's, I don't know if that would be, oh yeah, I guess it would. I guess it would be south. Anyway, anyway, let's get going with chapter 16, The Starving Roamer. The next morning, after a breakfast of plums and coarse bread, they set out again. Maddie made Lena a place to sit at the back of the truck between two of the crates. She took the blankets they'd slept on and spread them on the rough floor of the truck. Lena could sit on the blankets, lean against the nearest crate, and dangle her legs over the truck's back edge. The burn still hurt this morning. It was a reddish, angry-looking blister. After a while, as the sun came up and sweet grassy smells arose from the earth, Lena began to enjoy herself again. She watched the countryside fall away behind the truck, stretches of brown gold grass as big as the sky, trees like hairy spikes, rocky slopes, and this is how it was for four more days. At night, they would find a place by a stream to sleep, if they could find a stream. They passed other oxen-pulled carts and trucks on their way, both going their direction and coming back. They would stop and talk with these roamers and sometimes trade with them for food. Casper always asked if they'd been to the city. Very few of them had. The ones that had been there just shook their heads when Casper asked if they'd found anything interesting. It's a waste of time to go there, they said. Don't bother. Most of the roamers they met had been scavenging in what they called the suburbs, which Lena understood to mean towns that lay around the city. Casper and Maddie hardly spoke to her at all during the day. Around noon, they would stop the truck and get something to eat from the chest of provisions they'd brought. At first, there was dried fruit, but they soon used that up. After that, it was traveler's cakes, morning, noon, and night. Casper always went to sleep right after he'd filled his belly. He lay back on the ground and snored. Then Maddie would beckon to Lena with a tilt of her head, and they would walk away from Casper and find a place to sit, often beneath a tree, one of those trees that spread their branches out like the top of a big mushroom. They would sit in the soft grass and look up at the sky through the tree's branches. Sometimes, a breeze swept across the land and brought them the scent of dusty earth and dry weeds. After lunch on their second day of traveling, Lena asked Maddie where she came from. A horrible place was all she said. Horrible in what way? Small, cold, and poor. Houses made of old boards. Bad soil for growing things. Never enough food. A place that was withering. What does that mean, withering? Lena asked. It means shrinking and dying. Things were getting worse there. There was too much sickness, too much hunger, too much unhappiness. People were always quarreling, and a lot of them were leaving. It was ending, the place where I came from. I wanted to be somewhere that was beginning. Our city was ending too, said Lena. She looked up at the blue sky and thought about the sky in ember. Utter blackness, not a speck of light. No lights shone anywhere in Ember now. There's no one left in our city, she said. Sparks is a place that's beginning, said Maddie, if it can get past the hard spots. Hard spots? Yes, like suddenly having to take in 400 people. Oh, said Lena, remembering the conflicts in the village and all the reasons she wanted to get away from there. Her heart sank. Maybe by the time we get back, that will all be over. All that trouble, she said. Maybe, said Maddie. I hope so. Sparks is a whole lot better than where I came from. I can understand why you wanted to leave that place, said Lena. Pretty badly, said Maddie. Bad enough to take up with a fool. A fool? Maddie just tipped her head toward the sleeping Casper. You came with him just to get away, Lena whispered. Maddie nodded. Romers hardly ever came to our little settlement, she said, mainly because we had nothing to trade. Casper was only the second one I'd ever seen. I thought I might never see another, so I grabbed the chance. Why couldn't you just leave by yourself? I thought of it, Maddie said, but I didn't know where to go. I didn't know the roads or where the settlements were. 
I didn't know how I'd get food. I guess I just wasn't quite bold enough to go alone. When you got to Sparks, you could have stayed there, Lena said. You didn't have to keep traveling with him. I would have stayed, said Maddie, if I hadn't promised to help him on this quest of his. I try to honor my promises, if I possibly can. That afternoon, as they traveled on across the rolling hills, Lena thought about places that were ending and places that were beginning. She knew about endings. Now she wanted to be part of a beginning. Maybe the people of Ember could begin again in the city. If not, well, she wouldn't think about that until she had to. On the second night, they pulled up besides the ruin of a town. Not much was left of it, but you could see that once there, um, once there had been hundreds of houses. The concrete foundations, overgrown with weeds, lined up along the curved streets. Here and there, a wall or chimney was still standing. Casper stopped the truck just beyond the outer row of ruins, and Maddie went around to the back and opened the trunk that held their dwindling supply of food. They had stopped beside a ditch where a trickle of water ran. It was green, scummy water, but Lena drank it anyway. It was all there was. Casper seemed especially grouchy. His pink face was splotched and damp, and his eyes looked inflamed. He had forgotten to twist his mustache into points and it hung down at the corners of his mouth. He dug a crumbling traveler's cake from the trunk and glowered at Maddie. "'What's the matter with you, anyway?' he said. "'You haven't been very chatty lately.' "'I'm never chatty,' said Maddie calmly. Casper took a savage bite of his cake. "'It's like traveling with a tree stump,' he said. "'I thought you were going to be a pleasant and helpful companion.' Maddie did not reply to this. She chewed serenely gazing out over the acres of fallen houses. Lena realized there was a certain beauty in Maddie that she hadn't seen before. Her back was straight, she held her head high, and there was something unswayable in her. The bones of her face were strong, and her gaze was firm. There was nothing fluttery about her. You could see that Casper was finding out that she was not what he'd taken her for at first. She was more than he'd bargained for. On the third day, near evening, they saw a truck coming toward them from a great distance away. They were on a long, straight road with few trees or buildings to block their view, just the dry, brown grass and a few ancient fences leaning over, and flocks of birds rising, swooping through the air, and fluttering down again. Up ahead came this dark dot, toiling forward. In twenty minutes or so, the two trucks drew near. Lena stood behind Casper and Maddie, looking forward. This roamer looked poor. He had only one ox, a shaggy, sway-backed animal, and on his truck there were only two crates, not four as on Casper's. The man himself was almost as shaggy as his ox. His hair was long, and his beard lay like a hairy brown bib against his chest. As he came closer, he stood up on his truck and shaded his eyes with his hand, peering at them. Watch out for this one, Casper said. Could be a bandit. Looks bad and mean and dangerous. When the other truck was 20 or 30 feet away, its driver suddenly hauled on the traces. His ox veered, and the truck turned sideways so that it blocked the road. Lena couldn't tell if he'd done this on purpose. His movements were jerky, as if something was wrong with him. He climbed down from his truck and stood in front of it, his neck tucked down and his shoulders hunched as high as his ears. His eyes glittered in his hairy face. He stood there like that, saying nothing, waiting for them. Casper stopped the truck. He stood up and leaned forward. Out of my way, you ragged wretch. Move that flea-bitten rig. The roamer came a few paces closer. His mouth opened, a hole in the tangle of beard, but no words came out. Lena could see the back of Casper's neck flush deep red. I said, out of my way. He snatched up his whip and sent the long lash curling out toward the man and snapped it a few feet from his face. The roamer let out a howl. He lurched toward them. All this happened in only a minute or so. Lena's heart was beating wildly. Was this a bandit? Was he going to attack them? She ducked down behind a crate and peered between the slats. Casper raised the whip again. Come any closer and I'll cut you to shreds, he shouted. But before he could lash out, Maddie grabbed his arm. Wait, she said. 
Casper tried to shake her off, but she yanked at him so hard he lost his balance and sat down again. Why not find out what the man wants before you attack him, she said. Casper struggled against her, but she was strong. She managed to wrench the whip out of his hand. Then she jumped down and confronted the other roamer, who had halted just in front of the truck. What do you want from us, she said to him, standing squarely in his path, her hands on her wide hips. Why have you stopped us like this? The roamer backed up a step. He looked at her with his mouth hanging open. He was grubby, Lena saw. His hands and his feet were nearly black with dirt. He mumbled something. Maddie bent closer to him. What? He mumbled again. She turned to Casper, who had climbed down from the truck and was approaching with his fists clenched. He says he's out of cakes. She turned back to the man. How long since you've eaten? The man stared at his hands. He had long, filthy fingernails. His fingers twitched. Three days, he croaked. Just crumbs. Three days. Well, said Casper, if you think we're going to supply you with food, you're very mistaken. Surely we can spare a couple of cakes, Maddie said. Casper's face was dark red. We cannot, he said. We are on a special mission, extremely important. We need that food for ourselves. All of it. Lena thought this was unreasonable. He can have one of mine, she said. Casper whirled around. No, he said. You're going to need your strength. You're being ridiculous, said Maddie. But Casper reached out and pushed her. Back in the truck, he said. And you, turning back to the roamer, get your rattle trap out of my way if you want to stay alive. From the roamer came a sound Lena had never heard before from a human being. A hoarse hissing sound, as if he were spitting a steam of fire straight at Casper's face. He did this twice, and then he turned away and scuttled back to his truck. He pulled on the ox's traces, and it moved a few feet along, just far enough for Casper to drive his truck past it. Casper yelled at him one more time as he passed. You shouldn't be a roamer if you can't feed yourself. He cracked his whip at the man and drove on. Lena climbed into a crate and sat with her head on her knees for a while after this. She was horrified by the starving, filthy roamer. How did he come to be in such a state? Was it his own fault? Was he a madman? But Casper could have given him something, couldn't he? Or were they so low on food that losing any of it really would harm them? Her stomach lurched. She felt queasy, but she didn't know if it was hunger or horror at what she'd just seen. That night, Lena woke up for a moment and heard the oxen making unsettled noises. She heard a creaking sound, too, but the sound stopped, and she went back to sleep. In the morning, Maddie discovered they had been robbed. Well, well, she said, opening the food chest. Look here. What, said Casper, who was wetting his mustache with spit and twisting it into points. Someone's been into our food, said Maddie. I wonder who. Casper jumped to his feet. Into our food? He didn't get that much, Maddie said. Just three or four, I'd guess. She put her hand in the chest and felt around. But he's left us something. Sputtering with rage, Casper hauled himself up onto the truck. When he looked into the food chest, he let out a string of furious swear words. Lena crept out from under her blanket and stood up. What is it, she said. What happened? Our friend from yesterday has been for a visit, Maddie said. We wouldn't give him what he wanted, so he took it. And left us something for us, too. Left what, said Lena. Casper was shaking with fury. His face was dark red. Looks like dirt said Maddie. I think he took what he wanted and dumped a bag of dirt on the rest. She wrinkled her nose. Might be some ox droppings in there, too. The skunk, Casper cried. The miserable rat. In my opinion, said Maddie, you should have given him a couple of cakes in the first place. I didn't ask for your opinion, said Casper. You're going to get it anyway, said Maddie, suddenly fierce. You turned a crazy old guy into an enemy in less than two minutes. You did it. You've done it over and over, and I've seen you. You approach people like an enemy, and bam, they turn into one, whether they were to begin with or not. It's my policy to be ready to defend myself, said Casper, scowling, at any moment. Fine, said Maddie. So now, because of your policy, we're out four cakes instead of two, and we have a lot of dirt on the rest. She closed the chest, stood up, and glared at Casper with a mixture of anger and scorn. 
If you ask me, making friends is a better defense than making enemies. I didn't ask you, said Casper. On the fourth day, they went uphill, hour after hour. The heat was terrible. The only water they found was at the bottom of a deep ravine. All three of them scrambled down, half-stepping, half-sliding. Carrying Casper's biggest pots and sweating and gasping, they lugged to fill the pots back up so that the oxen could drink. Then they went uphill some more. It was late afternoon by the time they came to the top of the ridge. Lena was so tired by the time and so hot that she felt like a boiled vegetable, limp and runny. She was a bit dazed, too, only half awake, and so she was startled when the truck jolted to a stop, and she heard sharp exclamations from Casper and Maddie. She jumped down and went around to the front. A tremendous view of land and water lay before her. Such immense water she had never seen. Green-blue, glinting in the rays of the light sun. White ripples racing across its surface. To her right, it stretched as far as she could see. But straight ahead, she could see the shore on the other side. Green trees covering the ground and hills rising beyond. The bay, said Casper. This means we're almost there. We go around the end of it and then north. When do we get to the city? Lena said. Tomorrow, said Casper. His wide face broke into a grin, and he laughed his high, weird laugh. He opened and closed his fingers, stretching and gripping, as if he were imagining taking hold of something. We'll be there tomorrow, and then our work begins. End of chapter 16. I feel like it's getting, like, we're getting more backstory with Casper and Maddie, and I'm really liking it. I love backstory. I think it's, like, the best. I love hearing about, like, why you know, like people's personalities, why they are the way they are, why they make their decisions. It makes the story good. Oh, let me check my, um, my whispers. Oh, I didn't know that. Okay. That's not where I guessed. That's not where I guessed. I don't know if I've ever been there, to be honest. Probably... Probably, and I just don't remember, but I was thinking a different place. Get another stretch in. Always good to stretch in between chapters. It does not feel like it's only been an hour. I think time is just like completely wrong today because it doesn't feel like noon. It feels like it's like seven at night, <laughs> even though it's not. It's literally morning and for one more minute. Never mind. It's no longer morning. Um, but it's just like time does not feel normal today. It doesn't feel like it's only been an hour. I feel like I've been reading for like three hours. Not in a bad way. Not in a bad way at all. It just seems like today has been so long already, <laughs> even though I've only been awake for like three hours which is crazy. Pretty crazy. <sighs> but so I think we'll read for maybe another hour. Hopefully we'll see. Um, usually I read about like four or five chapters per stream. Um, Cause I try not to read a ton at once just so my voice doesn't die. Um, so, so far We've read three chapters. In one hour, we've read three chapters. That's nuts. So maybe we'll read two more today. Um, let me see how long they are, actually. Okay. Oh. Okay, yeah. Reading two more chapters would actually be really good. Because they're not very long. Um, possibly even three more chapters. We'll see. We'll see. So let's get going. Chapter 17, Dune Accused. Word of the tomato throwing and Torrin's accusation of Dune spread quickly through Sparks. Some people believed Torrin, some didn't, but no one could prove who was telling the truth. Torrin said he'd seen what he'd seen in the middle of the night when he couldn't sleep and took a walk to the field to look at the stars. 
Dune said he'd been home all night sleeping, and that his father and the others in his room knew it. But people said he could have slipped quietly out without anyone knowing, couldn't he? He could have gone down there and done his mischief and come back, and they all would have thought he'd been sleeping the whole time. At noon that day, when he and the others showed up at the Parton's house for their midday meal, no one spoke to them. Martha let them in, and they sat down at the table where their places had been set for them as usual. Dune's father said, good day, and Mrs. Polster said, how are you? And Miss Thorne and Edward Pocket looked around at the family's stony faces and tried to smile. Orney put food on their plates, was it an even smaller amount than usual, and passed the plates to them. <clears throat> Kenny ate tiny mouthfuls. His eyes darted nervously from face to face, but no one spoke. Finally, Dune's father said, Excuse me, but perhaps there's been a mistake. Martha looked at him coldly. I don't believe so, she said. Perhaps you're thinking, Dune's father went on, that my son Dune actually did what he has been accused of. In this household, said Martha, we do not approve of wasting food. Neither do we, cried Dune. I would never do such a thing. I didn't do it. All eyes turned toward Dune. He could feel a red flush rising in his face. Really, he said, keeping his voice calm. I didn't. Who did then, said Orney. I don't know, said Dune. No one knows, said Mrs. Polster in her firmest voice. Certainly we aren't going to believe the word of one unhappy little boy against the word of this young man who has proved himself so outstanding. Why not, said Martha. Torn Crane is a decent boy as far as I know. I don't see why you call him unhappy. All you have to do is look at him, Mrs. Polster said. Miss Thorne nodded. I do think she's right, she murmured. Well, one of you people must have done it, Martha said. Certainly none of us would have. Nothing has been proved one way or the other, said Dune's father. It would be unfair to draw any conclusions. There was an uncomfortable silence. Everyone focused on eating. When it was time to leave, Kenny passed out the food parcels, and as he handed one to Dune, he silently mouthed three words, I believe you. At least one person was on his side, Dune thought. It made him feel better, but only a little. In the end, because it was one person's word against another's, and there was no proof either way, nothing was done. Officially, the identity of the tomato thrower remained a mystery. But the effect of all this was to make the people of Sparks and the people of Ember even more resentful and suspicious of each other than they had been before. Dune felt unfriendly eyes following him wherever he went. At first, he tried to explain when people glared at him that way. He spoke reasonably. Why would I get up and walk all the way into a field in the middle of the night to throw tomatoes at a wall, he said. It doesn't make any sense. But people didn't seem interested in reason. He was one of them and that meant he was strange and might do anything. So Dune stopped trying to explain. He kept his eyes on the ground and ignored the people who muttered darkly as he passed by. It wasn't just Dune who suffered from the tomato incident. It was all the refugees from Ember. Sometimes the villagers called them names right out loud on the street. It was as if those smashed tomatoes had brought all the quietly rumbling resentments out into the open. The town simmered like a pot about to boil over. One morning, Dune found a crowd gathering in the plaza when he came into town for work. Both Sparks people and Ember people were clustered together, looking at something. He edged between them to see what it was. Across the pavement, someone had scrawled a message. It looked as if it had been written in mud. The sloppy, runny letters said, They must go. The crowd stared at it silently. A few of the villagers seemed embarrassed. They looked sideways at the Emberites and shook their heads. Mean, someone muttered, but others scowled. One man, noticing Dune, glared at him so angrily that Dune felt as if he'd been punched in the stomach. This message was there because of him. He knew it. He put his head down and hurried away. At the hotel that night, people were upset. They clustered in buzzing groups out by the front steps, talking about the words painted on the plaza. Dune saw Tick striding among them, speaking with everyone, his face flushed and his eyes glittering. 
When he came toward Dune, he paused. They've turned against us, he said. I knew they would. We mustn't stand for it. And he plunged back into the crowd. A day passed, and then another. The sun blazed down, but Dune felt as if darkness had invaded him. Protests and questions raged through his mind. Why had Torn pointed at him? Was it just at random, or had he singled him out for some reason? Why did Chugger believe Torn and not believe him? Who had written the muddy message on the bricks of the plaza? Lena did not return, and this added to Dune's glumness. According to the note she'd left for Mrs. Murdo, she should have been back by now from whatever she'd gone. Dune's feelings about her were divided between worry and anger. He tried not to think about her, since there was nothing he could do. Whenever he had a free moment, he holed up with a book and tried to forget about what was happening in the village. Edward Pocket brought him a steady supply. Edward was obsessed with his job. Every now and then, Dune would ask him how it was going, and Edward would get a feverish look in his eyes and say, Ah, it goes by inches, young Dune. By millimeters. I've done this much. He held his thumb and forefinger a tiny distance apart. And this much remains to be done. He stretched his arms as far apart as they would go. It's a gargantuan task. I press forward, but will I finish in my lifetime? It's doubtful. His fingers black with dust, he often came home in the evening later than the workers who went into the village, and he was so tired by then that he usually went straight to bed after dinner, even though it was still light. Dune would hear him mumbling in his sleep inside the closet. He could make sense of only a few words. Caterpillars, Edward would say. Cathedrals. Cattle. Chemistry. Christmas. Then he'd groan and thrash about, banging his bony limbs against the closet door, and go silent for a while. When he muttered again, he'd be on a different letter. Hamlet. Harry Potter. Hawaii. Heart surgery. Hippopotamus. Hog farming. Dune imagined that Edward's mind was so stuffed with information by now that there wasn't much room for any more, and the excess had started leaking out in the night. Sometimes, Dune passed the Spark School on his way to work in the morning. It was a small building, with a wide, open porch all around it, where the students often sat to do their lessons. The children of the village, there weren't very many of them, went to school only a few hours a day, and only until they were ten years old. Kenny Parton went there. He would wave to Dune when he saw him going by, and before the, troublesome with to, or before the trouble with the tomatoes, the other children would look at Dune curiously, a few of them smiling. But the first time Dune passed the school after the tomato trouble, he saw 15 or 20 cold eyes faces turn toward him. Someone shouted, Get out of here! And someone else threw a crumpled wad of paper over the porch railing at him. He walked faster, looking straight ahead. A moment later, he heard the teacher scolding the class for rudeness but not very sternly. The next day, as Dune and the others arrived at the Partons for lunch, Kenny peeked out from behind a corner of the house and beckoned to Dune. His eyes wide, his voice even softer and more timid than usual, he said. You know at school yesterday? Dune nodded. I was sorry they yelled at you, Kenny said. They shouldn't. You didn't do it. How do you know? said Dune, who was feeling crabby just then at all the residents of Sparks. Maybe I did. Kenny shook his head. No, he said. I don't think so. Why not, said Dune. I can just tell, said Kenny. I can tell about people. You wouldn't. He gave Dune a quick, shy smile. Dune was touched. Kenny looked like a timid little wisp, but there was something strong inside him. I wish you didn't have to leave, Kenny said. Dune smiled. We'll be here for a few more months, he said. Then what? Kenny asked. We go away and make our own town. Where? asked Kenny. Dune shrugged. I don't know. Out in those empty places somewhere? Kenny looked down at his feet. He stood for a minute in silence. Then he said, That will be really hard. How will you get food? Grow it, I guess. Just the way you do here. But you'll be leaving in the month of chilling. That's the beginning of winter. You can't grow food in the winter. Kenny said, looking up at Dune with worried eyes. Winter, said Dune. What's winter? You don't have winter where you come from? Kenny's eyes grew very round. You mean it's always summer there? 
Dune was confused and slightly alarmed by Kenny's tone. I don't know those words, he said. Kenny stared at Dune, his face blank with surprise. Seasons, he said. They're the seasons. In summer it's hot, in winter it's cold. That's all right then, said Dune relieved. We're used to cold. But you can't grow food in the winter. It's really cold. And clouds come over the sun and it rains. Rains? Kenny was so amazed that his mouth dropped open. He flung his arms up and wiggled his fingers like drops sprinkling down. Rain, when water comes from the sky, and the river rises, and sometimes it floods, and the dirt turns to mud. Dune felt as if his mind had suddenly stopped. He stared at Kenny's wiggling fingers and tried to grasp what he was saying. Water dropped from the sky? But... People's clothes would get wet. Everyone would have to stay inside. And if they couldn't grow food... Wait, he said. You mean the town leaders know it will be winter when we leave? They know it will be cold and wet? I guess so, Kenny said. He lowered his eyes, then looked up again. Probably they mean to send food with you, he said, to get you through the winter. That must be it. He gave a small, hopeful smile. That must be it he said again, and he darted away toward the front door and went into the house. Dune followed. His vision of the future, already shadowed by anxiety, had just grown several shades darker. One morning, a week or so later, as Dune came out of the door of room 215, he nearly bumped into Tick Hassler, who was running at full speed down the hall. Something's happened, Tick called to him. What? said Dune, breaking into a run himself to keep up with Tick. I don't know, Tick said, but I heard people out in front shouting. Tick must have jumped out of bed and not taken time to do anything but throw on his clothes, Dune thought. He hadn't combed his hair, he hadn't tr tied his shoes, he hadn't even washed his face. There were gray smudges on his neck and below his ear. In the usually well-groomed Tick, these were signs of serious alarm. Dune's heart beat faster. He took the stairs three at a time, crossed the lobby, and still following Tick, pushed through the front door. Outside, a crowd stood in the field, staring up at the hotel. Dune ran out to join them and turned around to see what they were seeing. Someone had scrawled words on the walls of the Pioneer, tremendous black letters, rough and scratchy, as if written with burnt wood. Go back to your cave, said the message over and over. Go back to your cave. Go back to your cave. The few ground floor windows that hadn't already been broken were broken now. Dune stood staring for a minute, feeling sick, and then anger rose in him. This was the work of whoever had slopped that mud message onto the plaza. Another ugly message, bolder this time. Around him, the others were rushing forward, shouting, staring at the scrawled words. Some of them stood silent and glum, with arms folded or hands in pockets. Others shook their fists in the air and vowed revenge. Tick was more furious than anyone, but he didn't yell. Dune watched him weaving through the crowd, seizing one person after another by the arm, talking in a voice as sharp as a blade but low and steady. His light blue eyes glinted like steel. It's what I thought, Tick said. This shows it. They've pretended to be kind but their kindness isn't real. Here's what we can know from now on. They hate us. He narrowed his eyes, lowered his voice almost to a hiss, and said it again. They hate us. They want us to, they want to get rid of us. Well, I'll tell you what. People are all around him toward toward him. They have, they want us to leave, but I'm not leaving. Are you? He scanned the crowd. No, said someone. Dune thought about what Kenny had told him. Winter, cold, rain. Maybe Tick is right, he thought. They do hate us. Do you like being called cave, cave people? Tick cried. Do you like being told to crawl back into a cave? And angry voices, twenty, fifty, a hundred of them cried. No, no. Dune went up close to the wall of the hotel and examined the word scratch there. He pictured the people who had done it, clutching their burnt chunks of wood, writing with big, angry strokes in the dark of the night. Yes, Tick was right. Hatred seethed in those jagged letters. 
He felt almost as if their strokes had scraped open his skin. End of chapter 17. And then we have the second town meeting. The three town leaders called a meeting after these unpleasant incidents, the tomato throwing and the graffiti on the plaza and the hotel wall. They met in the tower room of the town hall to talk. This is unfortunate, Mary said. I'm afraid these spiteful deeds will cause bad feelings to get worse on both sides. Wilmer nodded. Feelings are already bad, he said. These cave people, said Ben, are not as civilized as we are. People who will destroy two whole crates of tomatoes might do anything. We don't know for sure that one of them did it, Mary said. Come now, Mary, said Ben. I think it's safe to assume. And what about the people who wrote, go back to your cave on the hotel walls, said Mary. The problem is, said Ben, we don't know who did that. But I must say that I think they were expressing an understandable frustration. These cave people have adversely impacted our way of life. The food we give them comes out of the mouths of our own people. We do have a bit of surplus in the storehouse, said Mary. But why should we use it for them? It's our protection against hard times. Ben smoothed his beard and went on. I have a rule to suggest, he said. I think it would be best if the cave people didn't eat in the homes of families anymore. I think it's too hard on our families to have strangers eating with them every day. It would be better if the families simply hand them their food parcels when they arrive. Then they can eat somewhere else. Where? asked Mary. Ben waved a hand in the direction of the river. On the riverbank, he said, or at the edge of the field, or on the road. I don't really care where they eat, he said, as long as they don't intrude on our households. Quite a few people have complained of the inconvenience, said Wilmer. The Parton family seems the most unhappy. That's because they have that evil boy, said Ben, the one who threw the tomatoes. We don't know that he's the one who threw them, said Mary. We are as sure as we need to be, said Ben. So they voted. Should they make that rule? Mary voted no. Ben voted yes. Wilmer hesitated for several seconds, his eyes darting between Mary and Ben. Finally, he voted yes. I suppose this will make things better, said Wilmer. I'm sure it will, said Ben. We need to make it clear that this town belongs to us. This is our place, and these people are our only these people are only here because of our generosity. I think we have made it clear, said Mary. We went to all that trouble to make a flag and put it up on the town hall. No doubt that will help, said Ben. Still, we must constantly reinforce the message. If they don't behave themselves, they can't expect to stay here even as long as six months. They've just begun to get used to things, said Mary. They're not ready to leave. That, said Ben, is not our problem. Ooh. Okay. Let's see where this goes. Chapter 18, Casper's Quest. On the last night of their journey in the city, the travelers stayed in a real house. It was roofless, but most of its walls still stood, providing shelter from the wind that blew strongly off the water. There was no furniture in the house, of course. They sat on the bare floor. Casper was excited that night. He talked so much that he almost forgot to eat. His third traveler's cake sat on his knee, getting cold. At one point, he turned to face Lena. Now listen, he said. I'm going to tell you something, so you'll understand the importance of what we're doing. He paused. Then he spoke in a low, vibrating voice. I happen to know, he said, that there is a treasure in the city. There is, said Lena. How do you know? Old rhymes and songs speak of it, said Casper. The trouble is, said Maddie, those old rhymes and songs don't make sense anymore, if they ever did. They make sense to me, Casper said, but that's because I've studied them carefully if it, and have found out their deeper meaning. What do the old rhymes say? Lena asked. Various things, said Casper, depending on what version you hear, but they're always about a treasure in an ancient city. He looked into the air and sang tunelessly. There's buried treasure in the ancient city. Remember, remember, from times of old. One of them starts like that. 
Why hasn't anyone searched for the treasure before? asked Lena. I'm sure many people have, said Casper, but no one has found it. How do you know? Lena asked. Because obviously if someone had, we would have heard about it. Lena thought about this. She saw some holes in Casper's logic. Someone could have found the treasure, taken it away, and never said a word. Another problem, said Maddie, is that these rumors never say what city the treasure is in. It could be some city a thousand miles away. Casper gave an exasperated sigh and set down his cup of water. He raised two fingers and pointed them at Maddie. Listen, he said. Be logical. It's here that the rumors are passed around. I've never heard them in the far north, where I was last year. I've never heard them in the far east, either. This talk of treasure in a city, I hear it here, and within a hundred miles or so of here. Still, said Maddie, there are at least three ancient cities within a hundred miles of here. But only one great ancient city, said Casper. That's the one we're going to. A city is big, Lena said, remembering the myriad streets and buildings of Ember. How will you know where in the city to look for the treasure? A crafty look came over Casper's face. He smiled, with his lips pressed together and his eyes narrowed. That's where my careful study comes in, he said. Many, many hours of study. I've written down every version of the rhyme I've heard, which is a great many, 47 to be exact. I've compared them, word for word, letter for letter. Then, Casper paused. He looked at them in a way Lena recognized. It was the same way Torin looked when he was about to make a big impression. Then, I applied my skill with numbers. Numbers, said Lena. That's right. What you do is, you count the letters in the words. You count in all different ways until you start to see a pattern. The pattern is the key to the code, and the code tells you the secret of the message. He sat back, looking highly pleased with himself. And the secret of the message, Lena said, confused, is the location of the treasure, of course. Lena slapped a hand on his big thigh. It's obvious once you figured it out. Street numbers, building numbers, it's all there. Well then, said Maddie, what is the location of the treasure? Casper jerked his head back. You'd think I'd tell you, he said. I thought I was your partner in this, said Maddie. You'll know when it's time, said Casper. Until then, the information stays strictly with me. Lena glanced at Maddie in time to see her rolling her eyes toward the sky. That night, Lena couldn't sleep. Animal sounds kept her awake, scrambling and snuffling just beyond the walls, and a strange hooting in the distance. Dark thoughts troubled her here, too. Casper's search sounded all wrong somehow. She didn't want to help him. The thought of it filled her with dread. She lay on the hard floor of the house, staring at the black sky, feeling worse and worse, until finally she decided she must try to think about something else. So she said to herself, over and over for a long time, Tomorrow I'll see the city. Tomorrow I'll see the city. They traveled the next day, mile after mile, along a road that was nearly straight, though they had to trace a winding path around places where the pavement was pitted or thrust up or crumbled away. On their right was the vast green sheet of water, bordered by waving grasses where great white birds stood knee-deep in pools and rose like floating paper, and flocks of blackbirds flew up trilling into the air, their shoulders red as blood. On the left was a forest of trees so thick they hid all but the briefest glimpses of the ruined buildings among them. Lena's excitement was rising. She rode, standing up now. She'd climbed back into the crate and stuck her feet between the third and fourth slats of the side, which put her at the right height for holding onto the top edge and looking forward. She could see over Casper's and Maddie's heads to the rear ends of the oxen, their sharp hip bones sticking up, left, right, left, right, their tasseled tails switching back and forth. The sun sank lower in the sky until it was directly ahead, blazing straight into Lena's eyes. We'll be there before night, Casper said. The road began to slope upward. Hills rose on either side, and soon Lena could no longer see the water, just the brown humps of the hills, spotted with clumps of trees and scarred here and there by the remains of old roads and buildings. The air was cooler. They rounded a curve and all at once the city lay before them.
End of chapter 18. Coco, welcome in. Happy Thursday. How are you doing? Hi, I don't have one of my classes, so I can come early. Let's go. And I think I'm going to read one more chapter for today. So perfect timing. Perfect timing. Um, and the actually, this chapter is not super, super long. So, um, but I think it'll be good because then I'll, we've already been streaming for about an hour and a half. So that's, that's good for a reading stream, I think. Usually reading streams are a bit shorter than um, most streams. Because it's a lot of talking. I'm good. Had a little tummy trouble, but now I'm back to writing and relaxing so I can chill today. Oh, tummy trouble is like the worst because it's literally in the middle of your body and you like don't want to move. I totally get it. Glad you're feeling better. Workload has been light this week. Let's go. Love to see it. Heck yes. I know. I feel like I've been having such a weird week um, myself. I I mentioned earlier that like time has just felt very strange this week. I don't know if it's because I have like a couple days off, but I just don't know what day it is. I don't know what time it is. Like it feels like nighttime and it's not. It does not feel like a Thursday. I'm just so confused. <laughs> I'm so used to it, unfortunately. So it's just another Thursday for me. Aw. I get it, though. I get it. I have, like, I get headaches a lot. So, like, those always just kind of, like, interfere with life. But at the same time, you're just like, all right, I know what to do. I blame those stinking little bites. Oh, my goodness. Little bites are so good. But you know what? They make me... Like, I can't eat a lot. I One pack is, like, it. <laughs> one pack is, like, four little muffins. And I can't eat more than that or else I feel sick. Like, I feel sick if I eat more than, like, three or four of those little things. <laughs> so maybe it is. Maybe you're not alone, okay? Maybe they're just, maybe that's what they do. They're made that way so that you love them and you keep eating them, but it's torture. Maybe that's what they, they do on purpose. I don't know. I don't know. But they're so good. I, I get it. <laughs> I get it. Okay. Shall we finish up with the last chapter of the day? Let me see how, how long the next chapter is. Maybe two more chapters. I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> we'll see. Because they're not that long. They're not that long. So maybe we'll read two more chapters. Okay. Chapter 19. Unfairness and what to do about it. In the days after the hateful words had been scrawled on the wall, Dune went to work grudgingly. He didn't want to work with people who did such awful things. He had to remind himself that they weren't all ignorant brutes that they were still giving Embrites shelter and food, even though they were no longer allowing them to eat with their lunchtime families, and even though they were planning to send them out to fend for themselves in the winter. But the people who had written those words, no one was trying to find out who they were. No one was punishing them. Who was the one getting the evil looks and being called bad names? He was. He who had done nothing. He couldn't stand the wrongness of it. He felt it physically, as if he were wearing clothes that were too tight, a shirt that pinched him under the arms, pants that were too short and too snug. Unfair. Unfair, he kept thinking. He couldn't bear unfairness. One day, he was assigned to clean the fountain in the center of the plaza. Chugger handed him his tools for the job, a bucket, a long stick with a metal scraper on the end, and a pile of rags. Chugger lifted up one of the bricks in the pavement near the fountain. Under it was a round handle. You turn this off first, he said. It shuts off the water and um, it shuts off the water coming in from the river. He gave it several turns, and the spouting water in the middle of the fountain dipped and vanished. Now the water in the basin will drain through the outflow pipe, Chugger said. It goes back into the river. When the basin is empty, you climb in there and scrub. I want this thing clean as a drinking glass when you're through. Chugger left, and Dune watched the water level slowly going down. The lower it got, the more green scum was revealed. It coated the inside of the fountain like slimy fur. 
He plunged his stick into the water, scraped it along the fountain's inner wall, and pulled it out again. Wet green strings swung from the end of it, and he shook them off into the bucket. He thrust the stick in again, scraped again, brought up more muck. Into the bucket it went. For the next ten minutes, he scraped the bottom and the sides of the fountain with his stick and filled the bucket with slippery strands of scum, along with a few apricot pits, dead bugs, and rotting leaves. The water was about half gone now, but it seemed to be draining very slowly. Probably, Dune reasoned, because this was the outflow pipe was getting blocked up with all this loosened scum being drawn toward it. But because the water was so murky, he couldn't see where the outflow pipe was. <clears throat> At that moment, Chugger came up behind him. What the heck is taking you so long, he said. If you had any sense, you'd have figured out the drain is clogging up. He grabbed the stick out of Dune's hands and began probing in the water. I did figure that out, Dune said, but I couldn't see where it was because... There, said Chugger, who wasn't listening. He'd pried loose a clump of soggy crud, and the water level was once more going down. He thrust the stick toward Dune again. Now get busy, and try using your brain once in a while if you have one. He stalked off. Dune clamped his teeth together to hold in the rage that boiled up in him. He glared at the retreating back of Chugger and imagined throwing his stick so that it hit him right between the shoulder blades. I hate being talked to that way, he thought. As if I'm a moron. Why does he get to talk to me like that? When the water had all drained out of the fountain, Dune took his shoes off, grabbed a handful of rags, and climbed in. On his knees in the green slime that covered the bottom, he wiped and scrubbed. Now and then, people came by and peered in at him. Ugh, they'd say as they passed, or yuck. It felt as if they were saying ugh and yuck at him. Not surprising, since he was now just about as filthy as the rags he was using. No one said, good job, or said they were pleased the fountain was getting cleaned. When he finally finished, he opened the inflow valve and plugged the outflow valve, and once again, the water leapt from the central pipe and the fountain began to fill. Dune sat down on the rim and put his bare feet in the water to rinse them off. He stayed there for a minute, resting. The cool, clean water felt good. Chugger came around the corner. What are you doing? he yelled. He strode toward Dune. I don't know how you do it where you're from, he said, but here when we work, we work. We don't sit around gazing at the sky. Dune started to say he was not gazing at the sky. He was taking a one minute rest. But when he opened his mouth to speak, the rush of anger that came up through his body was so volcanic that he closed his mouth again and sat there shaking, his face flushed and burning, afraid he would explode if he tried to say a word. Do not get angry, he told himself, remembering the advice his father had given him so many times. When anger is in control, you get unintended consequences. You don't speak when you're spoken to, said Chugger. Maybe you didn't hear me. Maybe I need to make it clearer. He took a deep breath. His voice came out in a hoarse bellow. Get moving, you stupid barbarian, now. He seized Dune by the arm and yanked him backwards. That was when Dune felt his rage shooting up like a steam, unstoppable. Let go of me, he screamed. I'm not the barbarian. You are. You are. He tried to jerk away from Chugger, but Chugger held on. Dune pulled harder, wrenching his whole body sideways and slamming against the bucket, which was next to him on the rim of the fountain. The bucket went flying, spewing its slimy contents over a girl who happened to be passing by. She screamed and slapped at the stinking green sludge running down the front of her shirt. People rushed up to her and shouted angrily at Dune, who gave one more frantic pull and finally freed himself from Chugger's grasp. For a second, he and Chugger stood glaring at each other. Dune knew how it must look to the people around him. Clumsy, filthy, wide-eyed, and worse than that, a violent boy. The kind of boy who would waste good food. The kind of boy whose ugly, fiery temper could cause real damage. He turned and walked away. No one tried to stop him. He realized what he'd gone um, when he'd gone a short distance that he'd forgotten to pick up his shoes, but he wasn't going to go back for them. He ran barefoot all the way to the Pioneer. I've done it now, he thought. I've made everything worse, and yet none of it is my fault. I was trying hard to do my job and trying even harder not to get angry, but look what happens. The unfairness of it, the tremendous injustice, felt like a stone in his heart. We will do something about this, Tick said to Dune that night. 
They were standing by the hotel's back stairs, where they'd encountered each other on the way in from the outhouses. You're being abused. We all are. We mustn't stand for it. Dune nodded. He had told Tick about Winter, and now Dick was more outraged than ever. The look on his face was hard and determined. Dune admired Tick's strength, and the way he always seemed to know what to do. He himself was never so absolutely clear. He saw too many sides of things. It confused him. What should we do? he asked. Strike back, said Tick. They have attacked us, more than once, in many ways. It's time for them to find out that if they hurt us, they'll get hurt too. They'll get hurt. Was this the right thing? But it did seem fair. After all, wrong should be punished. How do we do it? said Dune. Many possibilities, said Tick. He leaned against the wall beside the stairs. He had a red patch on his arm, Dune noticed, and he kept scratching at it. It was the first time Dune had seen that Tick, too, suffered from the bites and scrapes that plagued the rest of them. He isn't perfect, Dune reminded himself. He isn't always right about everything. We could refuse to work, Tick went on, but everyone would have to refuse, and I'm not sure everyone would. It would be better to take direct action. Action about what? asked Dune. About food. We don't get enough. This is an injustice all of us feel. So what about this? We storm the storehouse and take what we need by force. Steal food? said Dune. It isn't stealing. It's evening things out. It's getting what should rightfully be ours. There was not a hint of uncertainty in Tick's voice. Dune thought about this. It did make sense. You had to act against injustice, didn't you? You couldn't just let it happen. I know lots of people who join us, Tick said. I'll call them together. We'll have a meeting and make a plan. He started up the stairs and then turned around and looked down at Dune. But first, he said, we have to arm ourselves. We do? Of course. We need to make sure we'll defeat our enemy. What do we arm ourselves with? I'll tell you, Tick said, when we meet, tomorrow night, after dinner, out at the head of the road. End of chapter 19. Okay, we'll read one more chapter today. Let me catch up on chat a little bit. Car, welcome in. Happy Thursday. How are you doing? How are you doing? Um, I think today might be a Chick-fil-A day. Let's go. Let's go. Cozy reading. Yes, it's the perfect day for it, Car. It's a rainy, um, gloomy kind of day, cold. Um, I think it's only in the like high of the low 40s right now. Um, so it's a little cold, but I think it's perfect. I'd be reading regardless. Um Last night, I sat in my bed and watched Legally Blonde. Oh, my God. I love Legally Blonde. It's such a good movie. It's a classic. It's a classic. It's so funny. Sorry I'm so late. Oh, my God. No worries. Didn't realize you were on. I'm always on on Thursdays, silly. Just kidding. Just kidding. I mean, I am, but <laughs> there's a clap emo. It popped up on my screen. Apparently. Apparently, there is. I saw it, too. I saw it, too. Wait. Do it again. Do it again. <laughs> I decided to take tomorrow off. Oh, heck yes. Let's go. I'm beyond thrilled with my decision. You deserve it. You deserve it. I'm enjoying the clap. Oh my God, look, there it is. There it is. I want to do it. Did I do it too? Does it work? Does it have to be capital? I don't do capitals. Oh, I think it does. <laughs> I think it does. Darn it. I hate capitals. <laughs> it's fine. It's fine. HS, welcome in. Happy Thursday. How are you doing? Oh, my, my caffeinated beverage is almost gone. Perfect timing. Perfect timing. Because we're going to do one more chapter of reading today. Which will actually probably lead us into about two hours of streaming, which is perfect for a reading stream, in my opinion. Um, GG to me for finally beating Pumpkin Jack. Oh, what is Pumpkin Jack? Is that a game? That is awesome. I think, did I see Terror playing that the other day? I think. Maybe. Maybe. I don't know. I, have, I don't think I've seen that game, if it's a game. But I believe it is. 
I believe it is. And GG, woohoo, Tara was playing. Okay, perfect. I thought I wasn't like going crazy. It's a platformer and I'm awful. Oh my gosh, I'm terrible at platformers. Like actually terrible. Hang on, just responding to a text. Wait, when was that? Oops. One moment. Oh, that was like an hour ago. Whoops. Whoops. Classic me not seeing messages for like an hour at a time. Whoops. <laughs> Whoops. Um, but yeah. Twitch really wants me to join the Air Force, Coco. <laughs> My goodness. That's wow. <laughs> wow. Um, all right. Should we get into the last chapter of the day? Should we should we see? And then maybe next time. No, I was gonna say maybe next time we finish the book, but there's still a whole there's no way. There's no way. There's still a whole part in like a half left. Um, when does part three start? Oh, not for like 40 more pages. Okay. Um, planes, trains, automobiles. <laughs> Imagine if train was spelled like plane. Oh, because we already have a plane that's spelled the other way. Interesting. Thoughts, thoughts. Okay. Here we go, everybody. Last chapter of the day. Get ready. Chapter 20, The City Destroyed. When the city came into view before them, the three travelers stood speechless, gazing out over ranges of hills standing dark against the western sky. They could see that this had once been a city. To the right, a cluster of tall buildings still stood, tall beyond anything Lena had imagined. But there was no more, they were no more than shells of buildings hollow and broken, their windows only holes. Through some of them, Lena could see the sky, turned scarlet by the sunset. All else was a windswept wasteland. Whatever buildings had once been here had long ago fallen and crumbled into the ground. Earth and dust and sand had blown across them, and grass had grown over them, softening their outlines. Here and there, traces of ruins remained, they looked from, um, oh, sorry, here and there traces of ruins remained. They looked from this distance like outcrops of stone, hardly more than jagged places on the, on the smooth slopes. Faint lines of shadow showed where streets must have once been. Lena stared, trembling. This was far, far from the city she had imagined. Not even the version she'd revised for the disaster had looked like this. This couldn't be called a city at all anymore. It was the ghost of a city. Even Casper seemed daunted. He craned forward, his hand shading his eyes. It looks somewhat destroyed, he said. It looks completely destroyed, said Maddie. They got down from the truck and stood beside the oxen. A trick of the light, said Casper, squinting harder. He pulled his glasses from his pocket and put them on. When we get closer, no doubt it will look different. How do you plan to get closer? Maddie asked him. And for the first time, Lena saw that a few yards in front of them, the road came to an end. There was an edge of broken pavement, and beyond it, a great slab of roadway slanted downward. It had stood on pillars once. You could see a few of the pillars still standing, and rods of thick wire twisting out of them. From here on, the road was a chaos of concrete, gigantic chunks leaning towards, uh, against each other. There was no way the truck could go on. The sun was nearly down now, and the brilliant red of the sky was fading. Between the ruined buildings drifted a gray mist, and the wind blew more sharply. Some white birds soared high above, screaming. It used to be so beautiful, said Maddie. I've seen pictures of it in books. There was a tremor in her voice. Lena looked up and saw that tears stood in her eyes. I knew it was destroyed, Maddie said, but not like this. 
What happened to it? Lena asked. It was the wars, said Maddie. They must have been... She shook her head. They must have been terrible, she said. What were they about? Lena asked. Maddie shrugged. I don't know. And the people who lived here? What happened to them? All killed, I suppose, said Maddie, or most of them. Casper was frowning at the shadowy wilderness that lay below. In the daylight, he said, I'll be able to see how to proceed. Proceed? Maddie grabbed, Maddie grabbed Casper's arm and wrenched him around to face her. Are you out of your mind? Casper yanked his arm away. No, he said, I am not. Maddie swept her hand out toward the city. It's miles and miles of buried rubble, she cried. Streets buried under fallen bricks and broken glass. Mountains of concrete and melted metal. Sand and earth blown all over it and grass growing on it. Casper nodded, his face grim. Right, he said. A challenge. You were right about bringing this one along. He tipped his head toward Lena. Someone small and light, that's what I'll need. Going to have to do some tunneling. No, Casper, said Maddie. You must give up on this idea. You can't find anything here. I can, said Casper. I can find it. I have the numbers. I have it all worked out. He plunged one hand into his pocket and scrabbled around and brought out a scrap of paper. He snatched his glasses off, put the paper up close to his eyes, and squinted at it. Lena took a step closer to him and peered sideways. The paper was black with scribbling, a tangle of words and numbers and crossouts. 47 East, muttered Casper. 395 West. His eyes flicked back and forth between the paper and the dark hills before him, flicked faster and faster. 71, he mumbled. It's just a matter of... In the daylight, he caught sight of Lena. What are you staring at, he said. Nothing, said Lena. She, sel she felt suddenly sick and frightened. Maddie was right. Casper was out of his mind. The sun disappeared behind the farthest hill, and darkness fell. Maddie turned back toward the truck. We'll camp right here tonight, she said. We still have enough water in the buckets. They set their blankets on the side of the truck away from the wind, but Lena shivered and couldn't sleep. After days of longing to arrive at the city, she wanted nothing now but to leave. This was a terrible place, full of angry ghosts and sad ones. When she closed her eyes, she seemed to hear their voices, shouts and screams and a dreadful sobbing, and to see flashes of fire in the smoky sky and sheets of flame sweeping through the streets. A wail escaped from her. She couldn't help it. She felt so afraid and miserable. A moment later, she heard Maddie's voice close to her ear. Let's talk for a while, Maddie said. Okay, said Lena. She sat up, wrapping her blanket around her. Casper was pacing up and down on the other side of the truck, muttering to himself. What about him, she said. Don't worry, answered Maddie. He's lost in his calculations. A gust of wind shook the truck. Its loose fender clattered. I hate it here, said Lena. Yes, said Maddie. Terrible things happened in this place. You can still feel it. Were the people in those old days extremely evil? Lena asked. No more than anyone, Maddie said. But then why did the wars happen? To wreck your whole city, almost your whole world. It seems like something only evil people would do. No, not evil. At least not at first. Just angry and scared. Maddie was silent for a moment. Casper's footsteps came closer, crunching on the gravelly ground, and then receded again. Lena inched a little closer to Maddie. It's like this, Maddie said at last. Say the A people and the B people get in an argument. The A people do something that hurts the B people. The B people strike back to get even. But that just makes the A people angry all over again. They say, you hurt us, so we're going to hurt you. It keeps on like that. One bad thing leads to a worse bad thing, on and on. It was like what Torin had said when he was telling her about the disaster. Revenge, he'd call it. Can it be stopped? said Lena. She shifted around under her blanket, trying to find a place to sit where rocks weren't digging into her. Maybe it can be stopped at the beginning, Maddie said, if someone sees what's happening and is brave enough to reverse the direction. Reverse the direction? 
Yes, turn it around. How would you do that? You'd do something good, said Maddie. Or at least you'd keep yourself from doing something bad. But how could you, said Lena? When people have been mean to you, why would you want to be good to them? You wouldn't want to, Maddie said. That's what makes it hard. You do it anyway. Being good is hard, much harder than being bad. Lena wondered if she was strong enough to be good. She didn't feel strong at all right now. Time to sleep, said Maddie. Lena pulled the blankets over her head, but still she could feel the wind and hear the oxen making low, uneasy sounds. She heard Casper still pacing, too, and muttering under his breath. I want to go home, she thought, and for the first time, the picture that arose in her mind was not of the dark, familiar buildings of Ember, but of sparks under its bright sky. She thought of Dr. Hester's house, and the garden blooming in the sun, and the doctor puttering with her hundred plants. She thought of Mrs. Murdo sitting in the doctor's courtyard, basking in the warmth, and Poppy playing with a spoon beside her. Even Torn was in the picture, proudly arranging his possessions on a window ledge. And of course, there was Dune. He should have been her partner on this journey. If he were here with her, she'd be less afraid. She missed him. Maybe when she got back to Sparks, he'd be tired of hanging around that boy named Tick and be ready to be her friend again. End of chapter 20